There are two assumptions in time frequency analyses that I would like to discuss in this lecture. One is that the uh, interesting features of the data that we care about have a sinusoidal-ish shape. So they don't need to be perfectly sinusoidal. But of course, we are using sine waves or tapered parts of sine waves to um, try and uh, pattern match uh, uh, features in the signal. And so the only kinds of features that we will be able to recover from the signal or you know, that we will be able to uh, uh, recover fairly accurately in the signal are those features that have a you know, reasonably sinusoidal shape. Um, another uh, assumption that I'd like to discuss in more depth here is that the frequencies of the oscillators do not change over time. Or if they do change, you know, that they change uh, relatively slowly uh, relative to the width of, uh, for example, the Gaussian used to create the wavelet. Um, yeah, so I would like to focus on uh, this assumption in this video and talk a little bit about how we might be able to get around this and, um, in fact, analyze or, or kind of focus on the um, time varying changes in the frequency of the oscillators, not just the power, which is normally what we look for, or phase dynamics. Um, in fact, there are two different ways of thinking about uh, frequency and two different ways of, of measuring frequency. The one that we've been discussing so far and the one that you probably think about when you think about the concept of frequency is the number of cycles per unit time, for example, seconds. And so here we have this um, sinusoidal pattern and we say, well, it's this frequency, 3 hertz, because within a time span of one second, there are three cycles. So this is one um, very intuitive and very valid way to, to think about and measure frequencies. But there's a slightly different way um, to measure frequencies, and that is the angular velocity. And what I mean by this is the velocity with which phase angles in this complex uh, space in a polar plane are, are moving um, uh, or spinning around. And so the faster these phase angles are spinning around per uh, instant of time, or you know the smallest uh, discretized chunk of time that you have in your data, the faster that movement, the faster that uh, uh, angular velocity, the higher the frequency. And so this is interesting to think about, uh, not only in terms of the concept of what frequency means, but also in terms of measuring frequency. Because when we think about frequency in terms of the number of cycles per unit time, then <clears throat> we can think about um, the changes, any changes in frequency within a unit of time are really just contributing to noise. So just making our, our uh, estimate of frequency less accurate. But here we can actually measure um, frequency uh, with a you know, millisecond precision. Um, so we can try and estimate something called the instantaneous frequency. And this, in fact, you've already seen in a previous lecture when I um, showed that the Fourier transform is still a perfect representation even of frequency non-stationary signals, um, although that representation is yeah, kind of uh, ugly, you know, it's, uh, it's a bit harder to interpret what's really happening in the signal um, uh, because the frequency structure is changing over time. Uh, and th this red one just, you know, to remind you was was the case of a perfect sine wave. This blue one corresponds to this piece, which is a uh, time varying sine wave. But what we can do now is, is um, if we think about measuring frequency as angular velocity, we can change how we measure the frequency a bit. And we don't need to assume that frequency components are stationary over time. Instead, we can actually make the frequency be the kind of dependent measure on the y-axis, and now we can measure the changes in frequency as a function of time. And so this would be the estimate of the, um, the frequency of this oscillator at each uh, time instant. And obviously you can see that the frequency is changing over time. It gets faster as time goes on, which you also see visually here in this sine wave. Um, so, of course, before learning how to do this, you want to know, uh, oh no, <laughs> first we are going to learn how to do it, and then we are going to discuss whether this happens in the brain. So, here is generally the procedure for measuring instantaneous uh, uh, frequency, 
And um, this is kind of a, an overview, and I'll show you this line by line in MATLAB in a few minutes. So we start with raw EEG data, um, and then we bandpass filter the data using, uh, in this case, a, a boxcar shaped bandpass filter, which you've learned about previously. So this could be like an FIR filter. Um, and then this gives us the time domain bandpass filtered um, signal or the bandpass filtered uh, components, and I should say the narrow band component of uh, this, uh, this uh, um, time series. The next step is to apply the Hilbert transform to get the analytic signal. And what we really care about is just the phases. We don't actually care about the amplitudes. We just care about the phases. So here's the phase angle time series that I extracted from this uh, single trial. And now the next step is to compute <coughs> these um, <coughs> instantaneous frequency, which I called frequency sliding here. Um, and the idea is that we want to measure uh, the derivative of the phase angle time series. Um, so that's that's this. We want to measure the difference between uh, each uh, or the, the difference between the phase angle at each time point and the next time point or and the previous time point. Um, and then we just scale that by the sampling rate in two pi, and that converts the um, the derivative in terms of radians to a derivative in terms of uh, frequency in hertz. Now, one thing that we need to take care of is that these uh, phase angles kind of artificially wrap around. And this you know about. This is as the phase angle cycles around the uh, circle, you have this seemingly awkward jump on this Cartesian space, but really these are just um, smoothly flowing around. And so what we need to do is a procedure called unwrapping the phase angles. And unwrapping basically just means every time that there is a big jump like this, we take all of these, actually we take the rest of the time series and just stack it on top of this. And then we go and then there's another discrete jump here and then we take the rest of this time series and push it up on the y-axis. Basically what we're doing is converting this sawtooth function into something that's kind of going uh, monotonically increasing like this because all these subsequent jumps are getting stacked on top of each other. Okay, so after we unwrap the phase angles, then we compute the derivative, we multiply by the sampling rate, divide by 2 pi, and again, the sampling rate and 2 pi are just scaling factors just so we can make the y-axis more interpretable. And this gives us our um, estimate of uh, instantaneous frequency or frequency sliding. It's useful in some cases if you have noisy data, you can get these really sharp spikes in the data. Um, so then it's, uh, it's useful to apply a filter to attenuate these uh, these things, uh, these noise spikes. Um, and this is, uh, we can do with a median filter, which I'll, uh, I'll show in MATLAB. So, but this is kind of interesting. Now, we are not looking at power dynamics. We're not looking at amplitude dynamics. What we're looking at here is the speed of this um, theta band oscillator over time. And so you see that the um, theta oscillation is um, faster here, and then it slows down a bit here. It slows down, slows down, and then it gets a little bit faster. Um, so, in fact, this is not like such a wacky concept. This is, uh, in fact, the basis for FM radio, right? That information is encoded in the time varying changes in the frequency of the signal. So that's called frequency modulation. Um, just very quickly, I don't want to get too much into the theory or neurobiology, but just to show you that these sorts of things um, do happen in the brain quite often, actually. If you look at the activity of individual neurons uh, or the firing rates of individual neurons as a function of uh, the uh, the amount of current that's uh, injected into the current uh, into the neuron, you see a very reliable pattern. This is sometimes called an FI curve. Uh, that the stronger the input to the neuron, the faster the neuron uh, fires. Um, this is seen in a wide variety of contexts. Of course, the the precise um, uh, functions of this uh, FI relation or the modulators of this FI uh, function uh, varies depending on the type of neuron and uh, the, the chemical environment and so on. But in general, you know, we can say that this is a very um, consistent finding that has been observed over many decades in neuroscience, that the stronger you drive uh, neurons, the faster they are going to 
um, respond. This also occurs not only in individual neurons, but also in networks of neurons. So when you have lots of uh, a population of, of neurons that are networked together, they will start oscillating faster when they have a stronger uh, input. Okay, so with that, let's switch to uh, MATLAB. And what I'm going to do in this first example is we're just going to simulate a frequency modulated signal. Um, and uh, yes, we have a thousand uh, uh, hertz sampling rate and over five seconds. And here I'm going to, with this variable FrecTS, this is going to be the frequency time series. And what I'm doing here is actually creating um, a um, uh, first just generating some uh, random numbers between 1 and 10 and then uh, linearly inter or I actually spline interpret so non-linearly interpolating across those points to get to the same resolution as time let me just show you real quick what that does so we go plot time ts so you can see this is a, a time series of numbers. And what's going to happen uh, in a few lines is I'm going to convert uh, these numbers to frequencies. So this is going to be the instantaneous frequency of the oscillator that we are going to simulate. Um, and then we take this, the ABS, because it doesn't really make sense for an oscillator to have a negative frequency. So uh, we just want these all to be positive frequencies. Um, if you look in this uh, code on line 16, you will see this is like the main uh, part of a of, uh, formula for computing a sine wave. We have sine 2 pi ft. And then it's a little bit different from what you're used to seeing um, because um, here, so we have the separate variable cent freak, and then uh, we have this, the cumulative uh, cumulative sum. Uh, these changes in frequency over time. This is just how you define a, uh, a signal with a time varying uh, uh, frequency. So then we take the Hilbert transform and now I'm going to plot a few things. So we take, we just plot the signal itself. We're going to plot the uh, angle, the phase angle time series. And here is the computation of instantaneous frequency. Um, we take the, uh, the phase angles and then we unwrap them. So that was unwrapping is uh, where we, we put all the phase angles uh, on top of each other to get rid of this discrete jump. Um, and then we take the derivative of the unwrapped uh, phase angle time series. And then we multiply by the sampling rate and divide by 2 pi. That's exactly what I described in the PowerPoint. Um, and then we're going to uh, plot this. So you can run this line. And this looks fine. Here's our signal. You can see the um, sine waves are going faster and then they slow down. So the um, frequencies are changing over time. <clears throat> Here you see the phase angles and you see the phase angles mirror the, uh, the timing of the oscillation, of course, of the sine wave. But we don't see anything here and we get an error that uh, the vectors must be the same length. So if you like, you can pause the video, take a minute and see if you can figure out what is causing this error and uh, how to fix it. So we know that there's a problem with the plot function and there's only three plot functions that we use here. The first one is for the, the top subplots. We know that works fine. This second one is for the middle subplot. We know that worked fine. So it's really uh, this one. So here's two. So it's one of these two and actually nothing was plotted yet. So it must be this one. So we can try running it again. Um, so now we've done the first step of debugging our code, which is to find exactly where the error is coming from. So now thinking about how the plot function works, uh, we need to input X and Y points, and those points have to match up to each other. And now the vectors must be the same length. So the error message is telling us that these two vectors are a uh, different length. So we can look at time and see that is a 5,000 by one, or sorry, 5,000 and one. Uh, vector, whereas this variable freak side is only 5,000. So this might seem wrong at first, because if you look at the signal itself, it is 5,001 time points. But actually, then you have to remember that we are using the uh, diff function, the difference function, which computes the first order derivative. And so this means that uh, the output of this function is going to be the difference between each uh, element and the previous element. 
So that actually means we're going to have one element uh, less in this uh, in the resulting time series compared to the original time series. So this is easy to fix. Then we just plot uh, uh, time one to n minus one. Okay. So now that's fine, and then we also plot the original frequency time series to see how they match up. And now you can see that uh, they do match up very well, except for at the edges. Um, so you get these edge artifacts because of the Hilbert transform. Uh, the Hilbert transform relies on the Fourier transform, uh, and so we get uh, edge artifacts here. Um, so this is, I guess, another illustration of um, how you always want to uh, be careful with edges whenever doing data analyses and signal processing more generally. But our um, uh, estimated uh, uh, free, uh, instantaneous frequency matches the simulated uh, instantaneous frequency extremely well, uh, you know, with, with the exception of these edges. Okay, so now let's try this again with real data. Um, you can look through uh, every line of this code on your own if you like. Basically, we're doing wavelet convolution with one single wavelet at 10 hertz. Um, and then we are going to compute instantaneous frequency the same way we did it up here. So here we see the raw uh, time series, and here we see the phase angle time series um, after convolution with a 10 hertz wavelet. And here we see the, the, um, the alpha frequency, uh, instantaneous frequency time series from this, uh, from this thing. And uh, which you see a couple things, you can see that the, uh, the peak frequency seems to slow down a bit after stimulus onset. That's something that uh, people have reported previously and, and something you often observe. And then you can also see that there, there are a few um, uh, noise spikes and you can see where these are coming from. So when something weird is happening in the phase angle time series, then you're gonna get something weird happening in the uh, frequency uh, time series. So this is uh, something we could try to avoid if we want. Um, and we do that by applying a median filter. And there are different parameters of the median filter. Um, you can see in this case, actually, I think this didn't really do a perfect job because this noise spike was, was quite large and also uh, a little bit wide. So it did attenuate that spike, but not so much. Uh, but this is only one single trial. So I wouldn't be overly concerned about something like this uh, that only affects one trial because, of course, single trial data are, um, are generally somewhat noisy anyway. And so presumably, hopefully, this is an artifact that only exists on this one trial at this one time point. So averaging over many trials will, uh, will attenuate this thing. Uh, let's see. So I'll just say something very quickly about the median filter. It's a little bit like a, a mean filter, um, except that as we go over time, over time points, you can see we're looping over time points. Um, uh, at each time point, we compute the median of the surrounding points. Um, and then we replace each uh, time point in the data by the median of the surrounding points. You can do that either using the, the MATLAB function median, um, or you can do it uh, manually here. So I just, I take the data that we want um, from this time series and sort them. And then I take the middle value, so the average of the, of the values, and that is the definition of median. If you plan on doing this kind of analysis a lot or using a, a median filter um, a lot or on a lot of data, then I can recommend uh, downloading this um, uh, uh, MATLAB um, toolbox called, uh, <laughs> actually, I, forget, I think it's called nth element or something. But if you, if you look on the internet for the MATLAB function mat fast median, you will find this, uh, this toolbox. It's compiled, so you have to have a compiler accessible in MATLAB. Uh, but it is considerably faster. For a short time series like this, it doesn't matter. Uh, but if you're really, you know, computing this method uh, or using the median filter on a lot of data, then it, it certainly makes sense. Um, the very last thing I'll point out is that um, we are uh, doing this on multiple orders. So we run through the data many times and compute the median over several different orders from 10 time points to 
400 time, uh, no, this is milliseconds actually, and then it gets converted into time points. Um, so this just, you know, provides some further smoothing to the, to the function. Okay, so uh, I hope you found that interesting and useful. That's, you know, just uh, a different way of thinking about, um, about uh, brain oscillations, neural oscillations, that they change over time, not only in their power structure and their phase dynamics, but also in their frequency characteristics.